streaming. Yes. And it hits me. Oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. All right, and welcome to the show. This is Martin Willis, your host, and I am actually in Russia. I know you people are probably tired of hearing that, and it'll be another couple of weeks that I'm here. But uh, the good thing is, is I get to talk to people like our guest today, Klaus Swan, who is in Sweden, and it's not the middle of the night like it usually is when I do my shows back in uh, the U.S. So it's great. It's, uh, it's 1 o'clock in uh, Eastern Standard Time. It's 8 o'clock here in Moscow and 7 o'clock in Stockholm where he is. And in California, I don't know what time. What time is it in California, Alejandro? It is 10 a.m. 10 a.m. I have this world... California love. <laughs> I have this world clock thing. I have to look all, all the time or I'm you know going to wake people up in oh, the middle yeah. of the night. Yeah. So just well, a couple... you're a man of international mystery. <laughs> just now. All right, so uh, I do want to thank our supporters, and if you'd like to support the show for $2 or more a month, you can find that information on uh, podcastufo.com. You can also watch us live uh, Wednesdays for a couple more weeks, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and uh, also on YouTube. We are YouTube live streaming, and uh, Alejandro and I, we we don't have video today, neither one of us. I I can't get it to work on my computer for some reason, and uh, so I just thought best... Uh, not being uh, trying to make uh, the news here on video, but uh, but uh, Klaus Svan will be joining us later, and he will be on video. So Alejandro, how's it going out there? It is going very well. Um, it's sunny and beautiful, um, and yeah, good stuff. Yeah, yeah. I am. Uh, I always enjoy California. It's such a wonderful place, yeah. especially where you go. It yeah. always seems like it's nice weather yeah. there, almost all the uh, time. Yeah, well. Yeah, but to get to go to the good places. But uh, yeah, and and just so people don't freak out, I'm I'm still updating all of uh, our stuff, so uh, you can still, you know, uh, go to our site and get news. We posted news today. We've got a UFO story we posted yesterday. We'll have one that we'll be posting today. So still keeping busy remotely wherever I am. So. No worries to those who are need their, their UFO news fix. That's right, yeah. And you do this, uh, I really like the thing you do, is the uh, UFO headlines. So you scour the yeah. news and come up with that every single, not well, not every day, but almost every day, right? Yeah, pretty much every weekday. And, and I think what's, what's interesting is that there's, there's something out there pretty much every day. It's rare that I have a day I can't find something and even uh last week there were a couple days where i found like too much you know there was a ton of stuff so yeah there's always something interesting going on uh that somebody in the mainstream media is writing about uh somewhere and you know a lot of times these are local papers but uh, sometimes it's not so for instance there's a story in vibe there's a story in the washington post and uh this is kind of interesting nt news um, which is uh, Northern Territory, Australia. They've been really writing quite a bit about UFOs over the last couple of years, and so they have another story out of what they say are their favorite UFO video clips, uh, and so we have that in our headlines today. All right. Are there some good clips? What do you think? Uh, you know what? I haven't looked them over that much. It looks like a lot of the clips are uh, hoax hoax videos that we've already talked about before, Uh-oh. Um, mm. but uh, not all of them. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing. There is some amazing UFO clips that are very well done. I'll put it that way. <laughs> that yeah, I've seen no kidding. YouTube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially the one that had like 15 million views or something and that CGI in Haiti or someplace like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that Crazy. one is pretty much the most viewed um, right. of mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that's a pretty interesting one. Uh, the other one that the NT has here is uh, uh, the Chile one. And, of course, that's been a bit controversial. And you had Leslie Kane on to, we both did, uh, yeah. and to speak about that one. Although, 
I had her on right when the vid the story had broke right. and the video got out. And then you had her on a couple of days later, and by that time, there were a lot of people who felt that they had figured out what that video was, that it was in an actual aircraft. So, um, yeah, well, I, yeah that was kind of cool that it worked out that way, that we both got that, you know, have right. them on at the different times. And I think I, if my memory serves me right, I think I suggested to Leslie that we cancel that show. Mm-hmm. Um, because it was it was it was kind of uh, figured out by that time that it was uh it oh I thought that. oh so you canceled it I thought you yeah. had it I'm pretty sure we canceled oh. yeah oh. save save face a little bit yeah oh yeah she yeah. did write an article though so and uh, she did, I know right. we had yeah. written a, a bit about that and at least we had talked about it I, I remember yeah yes yeah so what else is happening. Yeah, so other news out there. So uh, there's an interesting video. You and I have talked about this uh, a little bit. It was a story we did. <laughs> I'm giggling because originally I had, um, um, you know, had a typo in the title and I had the shinning disc, but uh, a reader had pointed that out. But with a shining disc, a UFO witness captures a shining disc on video near Toronto Harbor front. Um, the first thing that you notice about this video is that the Toronto Harbor front is beautiful. What it looks like a super cool place. Um, just to, and they've got this like spike, this big tower there, and this tower is actually prominent in this video as well. Um, but this couple was out uh, at the harbor front for Canada Day, which is July second. Now, why is Canada Day two days before July fourth? Are they trying to steal our thunder? That's another question. I don't have any <laughs> answers regarding that, but it does make me curious. Uh, however, these guys were out there for the festivities, and it was during the day, and they took a video, and I think you've watched this, and you think it's interesting, too, where it's this round object with, like, a, a dark center. It almost looks like a white uh, record, like album, mm -hmm. that uh, if, if you're younger and you've never heard of a record album and you're like, what the what the heck are you talking about? Um, look it up. There used to be these flat plastic discs that we played music off of, um, and that's what it looks like. It's like a, this white disc, uh, and it it disappears and reappears, uh, making it seem as though perhaps it's tumbling or spinning, so that when it you know we see the edge, we don't see it, and then once it comes around and reflects in the sun, and and the full face is facing us, then we do see it. Some people have argued that's not what it looks like, that perhaps it is a round object with something dark in the middle. And uh, many, you know, Mylar balloons are like that. They're, they're silver and they have, you know, a cartoon character or something or a teddy bear or whatever uh, in the middle. We see these at the grocery store all the time. However, the fading in and out, uh, I don't think is explained by, you know, just a balloon um, kind of turning uh, it could be possible that the clouds are blocking the sun and it's going in and out of shadow, but you'll see in the video there is not much sun there. So I think this is a really interesting video, more interesting video than we've seen in a while. And uh, I know you saw this. And, yes. and what did you think? Yes, I think it's, uh, I don't think it can be explained at all as a balloon just because it's so perfectly round and it seems like it's on a um, to, to direct, you know, to direct you to re boy, I'm having a hard time with that word today. Trajectory. It seems like it's on a path. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's words I have problems with. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's it, it gets very, very bright. Now I understand reflection could do that if it hits the sun. And then, like you said, if there could have been uh, a cloud that would be blocking the sun, although you don't see any clouds in the sky, or I couldn't see any. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very bright. It's moving. Um, it's very interesting. It just completely disappears and comes back into vision. Um, so I'm going to tell the uh, listener, check that out on openminds.tv, uh, that video, um, and see what you think. I think it's really fascinating. I think it's a good uh, a video that needs to be looked at hard. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really interesting. So uh, if, you know, if MUFON does post about it later on, we'll definitely update people. Um, and I hope they do because uh, it's an interesting video. And this is a MUFON case. I don't know if I mentioned that. So it was something that was submitted to them. So uh, yeah. originally in the story, 
I had only the video that uh, was posted on the MUFON site, so I linked to that, and you can still see that link. That's the raw video uploaded by the witness. But uh, then you or or somebody uh, you had notified me that uh, the it apparently the witness um, posted the video on YouTube yes. as well. So mm -hmm. I did embed that for people to see, um, and it, and you know even the reaction from the person. It's something that's helpful to analyze is how they post it what they're saying in the video, those sort of things. And it all seems genuine that this is uh, just, you know, a normal couple who um, who witness something they can't explain. I think so. And I do have to correct you slightly about one thing. Uh -oh. I think people know what records are. As a matter of fact, there's a resurgence. Really? Yeah, there's a resurgence of vinyl. It's coming mm. back. Haven't you heard that? Really? Heard that? Yes. Uh, people ridiculous. are buying turntables again and buying records. Now... If I'm wrong, uh, email me. But I think uh, I'm pretty sure that's what I've been hearing. I have a friend that sells well, vintage, and he was telling me there's a big comeback in vinyl. That's kind of silly, I think. <laughs> Just get they're fun. Hey, when I was a little kid, I had this one, and uh, it was like you know a little kid one where they're all big and bulky, and I had these little records that you could put on there and listen to, like about dinosaurs, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but it's ancient technology, man. You can use. Uh, your phone and everything, and what's cool, you know, even the the wiki 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 rapper studio things are all digital, so you can make that sound digital, and you don't have to worry about these huge discs that you carry around that break and melt. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know, but uh, that's good to know. At least uh, they're learning a bit about history. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, two more mentions before okay. we leave. I just want to sure. say, in the headlines, there's a couple interesting stories that have been out there uh, in the last couple, uh, last few days. One, I think this is cool. So Goop, which is a website that is owned by Gwyneth Paltrow, had an interview of uh, with Leslie Kane, who we mentioned earlier. And so that's kind of neat. And it's about UFOs, because, of course, she's written about life after death recently in her latest book. But uh, it is about UFOs. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's mm -hmm. something to look out for. And the other thing is, this is kind of interesting for any fans of Prodigy. Um, he's a musician uh, or, or passed away recently. But uh, I guess he had a UFO sighting. So there's a story about him having a UFO sighting and thinking maybe even he could call them in. But uh, that is a story that was on Vibe today. So that's something to look at, too, that's kind of interesting. So... Mm. Of course, you can find these uh, right on the front page in the Daily UFO Headlines, uh, the one from today. Uh, but if you go into the article and go to Daily UFO Headlines, you'll see some of the previous ones, and you'll be able to find uh, the link. I think that was Monday. It was the 7th um, to Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow's website. So that's kind of cool, I think. That is great. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, mm -hmm. I like the fact when, um, you know, you and I have had these conversations when before when, you know, celebrity gets involved at, and people take it serious, I should say, uh, more people will look at it, you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good thing. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, I think it's a good thing. The, the uh, You know, they all have followers. And some people, I think because they don't like the celebrity, get really upset. Who cares what they think? But, you know, celebrities have mostly, largely, like Gwyneth Paltrow, millions of followers. And people right. who are following her site. So it's introducing the topic, and especially with an interview from Leslie Kane, in a credible way to people who otherwise would have no exposure to this stuff. So definitely, I agree, a very positive thing. And I I always feel great about um, you know celebrities getting involved. I, I don't personally feel that's a negative thing. Some people feel there's credibility issues, but we cause our own credibility issues, no doubt. Um, enough so uh I, I, yeah i agree with you all right hey well you have yourself a great time out there all right thanks you too get some time on and the i beach. have a great interview all right yeah all right oh, thanks yeah, no i'll be out there within the, within the the hour <laughs> i'm sure you will all right <laughs> take care now talk to you later all Bye. right all right class are you there yeah i'm here hi welcome to the show <laughs> thank you thank yeah. you Thanks so much for being here. Let me just uh, switch, whip something out here real quickly. Um, all right. So, 
How are you, Klaus? Uh, welcome to the show. You've been on um, a, a number of times. I uh, always enjoy hearing from you a lot. And uh, can you give the listener who hasn't heard you before your background? Now, you started um, you started very young in this field. So why don't, why don't you talk about that and uh, what got you interested in the very first uh, first place? You know, we were young once upon a time, all <laughs> of us. And <laughs> I was uh, 15 of age when I started a small society in a small city in the south of Sweden, where I was born. A uh, city is called Mariestad, and we were only 10 or 12 boys, not a single girl in sight. That, uh, well, we, we, we decided that we wanted to know some more about UFOs, not just read about them. We wanted to go out in the field to uh, make interviews, to try to find explanations, to make uh, documentation. And since then, since that day, May 18th, 1974, I've done so every day of my life, really. A couple of hours every day. So, really? um, wow. yeah, <laughs> really. It's <laughs> not Christmas Eve, maybe, but uh, most of the other days I do something that really has to do with UFOs and to find an answer, a solution to this uh, enigma. Uh-huh. So I've been involved in UFO Sweden, which is the, uh, the organization here in Sweden. I've been um, chairman for many, many years. Now I'm, uh, I'm uh, second in command because I wanted some new, younger, uh, to come in and take it over after me, mm-hmm. but I'm still very much involved in UFO Sweden, and I also work very much with the archives for the unexplained, which we will come back to later, I presume. Now, if you're yes, absolutely, if you're watching live on YouTube or later on YouTube after it's uh, been archived, you will see in the background these are uh, books that are just. This is your home office, right? That you're in now. Yeah. Uh, but your uh, but the archives are up to. I asked you earlier before we went live. 32,000 books, which is just that's amazing. Only, that's, only, that's only the books, really, but we have 500 square meters of, uh, of area and uh, hundreds of thousands of magazines, hundreds of thousands of newspaper clippings. We have audios, we have uh, videos, we have uh, paraphernalia. We have all kind of stuff that you can really imagine that goes with the label UFO or you can say everything in the, into the paranormal so um, we collect and we uh, make things available. That's what we do. Do you have a lot of publishers that come out with a new book? I get a lot of new books in the mail um, all the time, which is really one of the benefits of having a show. Do you have that happen as well? People send you books when they publish them? Yeah, they do. And uh, But we also try to make contact with authors. Uh, so we are um, on top of them before they are writing, of course. And we travel a lot. I just came back from uh, Holland and Belgium. I brought back 500 books and a couple of thousands of magazines. I will go to Britain in, in October to bring back 100 at least boxes ah. with with UFO stuff. And uh, so that uh, I do that every year. And uh, we went to California uh, last year and wow. saved the fantastic archives in Eureka in California. Oh, yeah. I know where that is. Uh, would you say... Uh, what would you say is your most prized book in the uh, in the archives? Do you have the Holy Grail? <laughs> we, we have a couple of books from the uh, 1700s about um, uh, visions, uh, which are very very expensive. Ah. We took um, a couple of thousand dollars uh, for for each of the books, and uh, mm-hmm. have quite a few books in that range, really. But most of them are in the paranormal field because UFOs, well. They just started to to come around in the 1940s, and uh, they are not that expensive. But you can find books that we <clears throat> must pay eight, seven, or eight hundred dollars for if we want to buy them. Mm-hmm. So there are are fine things out there that we we have most of it now, but we're still looking for for some gems. Really, we are. Yep. Now um, I've talked to a couple of antique book dealers that just deal in libraries of books and I've always asked them to contact me if they find anything in UFOs mm-hmm. and I've talked to about three or four of them and I haven't had one single call yet <laughs> so no, it, I'm sure like it'll that. happen I mean, but you know it's hard to find them because um, there are not too many of them I, I, I met a lady in Holland just uh, last week she got a library like mine eight or nine thousand books and some are very very rare very nice things but mm-hmm. Mostly in Dutch, but some of them in English as well. Very nice. Now, who funds 
the uh, keeping of these books is itself like a self-funded organization? Or we are around 50 people that are uh, putting money from our own pockets into this. Wow. Um, so we are really doing this for ourselves, but for the greater benefit of others. We started in 1973 with, with AFU, and uh, since then we have paid for most of it ourselves. The last couple of years we had, uh, had some help from the Swedish Unemployment Agency uh, that put people with us uh, to work, and we do get some money for doing that. Oh, that's nice. But, uh, yeah, that's good, very good, because it's, uh, the, the government really is helping us in that way. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> the government <laughs> helping when it comes to UFOs. Um, do you have, uh, is there, is there uh, a need for funding of any kind to help help this? And, and, and tell, tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, it really is. This is uh, historical. This is of value for all mankind, I should say. What we are doing, nobody else is doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the money coming in from outside our own pockets are very limited. Yeah. We are always on the edge every month. It, it turns around, but mm -hmm. nothing more. We cannot save much. So uh, if anyone is interested, go to afu.se and take a look. And please, there are there are a uh, bottom donate. You could help us very, very much with that. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know someone who took a large, not, not a library like yours, but a library of antique books, about 5,000 of them, and he digitized them. Yeah, now, that's good. Um, now... Has there ever been any talk about possibly, I know that would be a vast undertaking, but has there ever been any talk about digitizing so that everybody can see what you have? Uh, absolutely. We are uh, digitizing every day, but mostly uh, UFO magazines uh -huh. and uh, news, newspaper clippings. Uh, we have digitized around a couple of hundreds of thousands newspaper clippings. Wow. And, uh, and maybe 150 magazines. So we are doing that all the time. The books, it's another topic really, because you have to have a book scanner. Yes. And the books are very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, we have saved money for buying one of those, but uh, uh, we have not really decided to buy it yet. But that will be the next step for us. Wow. So can anybody in the world go to this website and actually see those clippings that you already have digitized? Uh, not yet. You can go there, you can see uh, a lot of things. But we are going to publish uh, most of the things we have on our website, probably behind some very, very cheap but uh, annual donation uh, button or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then you can get access to, to the material we have. That is our goal. You can w visit us, which many people do from all around the world, to sit down and make copies and read. But we will be out on the Internet with uh, much more in, in, say, a year or so. Wow, okay. Now, um, so this is all very interesting, but everybody loves talking about UFOs, so we're going to sk skip along to that. But I think uh, it's wonderful that you have this available, and uh, the future can only be better as far as the digitizing of it. So um, you and I have talked about uh, ghost rockets in the past. This was back in, I think it was 1946, wasn't it? When the... And... Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in uh, in regards to that, but um, can you tell, say there's someone listening that has never heard anything about ghost rockets, can you talk about them? As you said, it was uh, in 1946 it all started, but uh, you can still see them uh, from time to time. But 1946 was a very special year, it was the year after the Second World War ended, and uh, everyone knew about uh, the V1 and the V2 bombs that, uh, that Hitler and Nazi Germany had created. And suddenly, in the beginning of 1946, strange objects, looking very, very much like the V bombs, started to fly over Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Mm -hmm. And, which was very strange, sometimes they crashed. They crashed into lakes never on ground. <clears throat> they crashed into lakes many, many times, and people saw them around the lakes, they heard a splash, they, they saw them in broad daylight, and the military sent uh, their investigation teams to the lakes. They combed them for weeks and weeks, never found anything except an indentation or something at the bottom of the lake, and they can see that uh, 
stones were, were thrown up on the shore and I could see that something had impacted there. But they, they put a very, very great effort into finding the solution of, of the ghost rockets. More than 1,000 observations were processed by the military in 1946. But they never found a solution. And up until today, it's still, they're still coming. You can still see them from time to time. And they are still crashing into lakes, which is very strange. That is so, that's always fascinated me from the very first time I heard about this. Have you ever spoken to an actual eyewitness of one? Uh, maybe 100 or something like that. I, I met. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. That, that must be. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to, to pin down the original observers. And I started with this in the early 1980s. Uh, and they were still alive, of course, many of them. Now, most of them are gone. Mm -hmm. But uh, the most interesting story, really, happened in 1948, two years after, when a man was sitting at the shore of, of a small lake south of Stockholm. In the middle of the day, he heard and he saw a huge rocket-like thing come flying from the south, navigating, diving into the water with a great water column 20 meters high, splashing up in the air. He was not an ordinary witness. He was the, the, the military, the highest military in Sweden, the commander-in-chief of the military. Wow. So when he saw that, he started a process. I mean, he started radar surveillance all around Sweden. He started an investigation into the lake. And I read his diary. You can see there that he was very, very puzzled. And uh, they were combing the lake. But it was a huge layer of mud, and they decided it must have sunk down in the mud somewhere. They never found it. But the last entry in his diary says, something found in the lake. Divers will come tomorrow. And then nothing. Oh. And we don't know what happened after that. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Hey, did anyone of the witnesses that you talked to talk about any sound that these things made? They, they could hear the sound from them. They were like airplanes uh, sometimes. They were also chased by one, one Swedish fighter pilot at one time, but he was outflown of this uh, ghost rocket. So they could hear sound, and they could see the sun uh, reflecting in the hull. They could see that there were no wings, no cockpit, sometimes small wings, but never a cockpit. They were never seen any creatures together with those. But there are observations later on with creatures as well, but not in 1946. Wow, I do want to talk about that before we move out of this subject. But one of the questions in the forum is, um, is there anything new to report about locating what crashed or landed in Lake Nama Jari? I can't pronounce that correctly. Um, <laughs> but uh, is that what you were just talking about, that particular... No, no, that's another one. Uh, Lake Namajaure is in the very north of Sweden. And uh, we went there in uh, 2012 and 2014 uh, trying to locate this object. Because in 1980, two uh, people from Stockholm were, were hiking up in this area. And suddenly at 11 o'clock uh, in, in, in the middle of the day, great day, in the middle of summer, they heard a sound from something flying in the air, coming from the south, flying over them. And they can see an elongated shape with uh, small wings, maybe, less than 100 meters above them. Wow. Go out over the lake, turned around 180 degrees, flew back towards them. And they were very scared. It was the middle of the Cold War. And they thought this was something Russian. Mm. And they thought something will hit us. Mm -hmm. But it didn't. It landed on the on the on the lake with a splash like that, and they could see it was sinking and the bubbles coming up from it. And that object we are trying to locate because this was reported to the military at the time, and they couldn't find it. Uh, so we went back with the witness, and they pointed where it was, and we made a sonar map of all of the lake. But as I told you, in 1948. The commander-in-chief, it was mud, four meters of mud. Mm. So we had to go back again in, in uh, 2014 with another equipment that could see through the mud. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
suddenly we got some very interesting uh, radar returns. And now we're going back again to try to take a real good look at the radar returns. This would be in this winter. We go on ice with small on small snowmobiles, trying to see through the ice and looking down on these exact spots where those returns were, were coming from. Wow. Now, um, how deep is the lake at that point? It's very shallow. It's ah. only four meters. Wow, 12 four. feet. Wow, something yeah. like 12 feet. Yeah. It's nothing, really. It's, uh, it's not a problem in that respect at all. But in the middle of nowhere, and, and, okay. and you cannot uh, go there easily because you have the permits and uh, you, you, are not, you cannot fly there if you don't have permits. It takes a lot of time to get those. We, we have those permits. We can do this. Mm -hmm. But what we can't do, we cannot bring anything out of this park. It's a natural park. Hmm. So everything that's in there must stay there. So if we find this stuff, someone else, maybe the military or the government in some respect, must help us. The government w must what they help us to bring. Oh, help this, you? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that would be nice if they would, uh, because it would cost an awful lot of money to get something up from the bottom. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, so, what would you consider? I mean, the the case you talked about, where this thing, or uh, this one, I guess, where it flew back and forth and everything, um, yeah. is just fascinating. What are some of the hypotheses that people are coming up with what these things uh, might be if they weren't you know uh, from another planet what if they were man-made what on earth would they be it's really a good question yeah I mean I've been I mean on top of this since 1980 in early 1980s and I, I have no idea what they could be uh, coming from or made of because the observations are very very good there are hundreds and hundreds of observers sometimes there are even hundred people around one lake Wow seeing this crashing down but nothing is found I mean there was a V-bomb in 1944 that crashed in the south of Sweden there was 2,200 kilos 2.2 .2 tons mm -hmm. of debris after that one and here nothing nothing at all I don't know. This is an uh, enigma to me. This is the, one of the greatest UFO puzzles I can think of, really. This is something that really is hardware, but you, you cannot find a trace of it. Yeah. That, um, that, that is something that makes me think of when something disappears. I always think of the possibility of interdimensional, but that, you know, every time I say that, people think I'm stretching it a little too far. And I, I have no idea, but you know, you just makes you wonder when there are no answers for something plane disappearing. You know what yeah. the heck it could be, and why yeah. would it go into a lake? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lake I mean, after lake. They, they were looking for lakes. I mean, you can see that they they really wanted to go into lakes because they wanted to to hide probably. Yeah. In the lakes, but why? Yeah. And how could they do that? Any, I mean, uh, yeah. It's, it's not an easy thing to, to understand. 1946, the Swedish military speculated that they were TV monitored and atomic energy monitored. There were also there were very very high tech things: TV, atomic engine, nuclear powered. That was the thoughts they had in 1946. 1946. Wow, they came up with that. Um, and has any of them? ever crashed into the ocean? Is there a coastal, uh, anywhere near any coastal areas where they've crashed? No, no, no never. Only on land lakes, <laughs> yeah. not in water outside, no. And how about um, any that ever been reported that um, people thought may have landed on the ground? There are no such reports at all. Uh, people have, have seen them vanishing behind the forest and thought maybe they were hitting the ground. But there are also lakes behind the forest, so you never know, really. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, people have been out in the woods trying to locate those things, but they never found anything. Have they ever seen them at night, or is it always daylight sightings? Oh, there were lots of uh, nighttime sightings as well, but most of them were probably meteors or other stuff. Yeah. Um, not very interesting, really, but there were hundreds of daylight sightings. And uh, as I told you before, one Swedish fighter pilot tried to 
to, uh, to get in contact, really, with one of those uh, rockets. But he was outflown by it, and he saw it, and his navigator saw it for a couple of minutes. Wow. But they lost it. Has anyone ever tried to take a picture of one? There's only one picture published, and uh, that picture, which was published in many newspapers around the world at the time, turned out to be a daylight meteor, which is very, very scarce as well. It's, uh, it's not a very common uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, and they happened to take a picture at the time that this meteor entered the Earth's atmosphere. Wow. So they got it. So that's <laughs> nice. But it was not the ghost rocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about that? Now, what about radar return, radar data? Is there any radar data on these? Yeah, there are. There, they had, they had some very crude radar at that time. There was not very good radar equipment here in Sweden. The British had a, a, a full team waiting for t through. It was called Task Force 196. They were waiting to come to Sweden to help out with good radar equipment. But the Swedish Prime Minister decided eventually to say no to it. And uh, we, we read a report, a formerly secret report from, from uh, the British. They were very, very angry with the Prime Minister. They called him, called him cowardly and stupid, because they really wanted to come here to do that. So there are some reports, some radar returns, but they are, they are not conclusive, really. But they, you can read about them in the military reports. Wow. Uh, yes. Uh so are people still, you say people are still seeing these. When is the last really good sighting that you're aware of? It was a couple of years ago, say three or four years ago, there was an observation up in the very north. The last really good crash was in 1999 in uh, the middle of Sweden. Seven people, I met all of them, um, did see around one lake from three different positions this elongated cigar-shaped craft coming down, crashing into the lake. And the military came there, and they worked for weeks. Wow. It was a secret operation. It was called Operation Sea Find, but they never found anything uh. in the sea. Uh, <laughs> we were on top of this because uh, it was classified, but we got uh, the names of the witnesses through the local police, which the military had forgotten to tell it was secret. Uh. So uh, <laughs> we got it that way. <laughs> Wow, that's great. And I know that when I had you on before, um, you were saying that Sweden does not ridicule um, the UFO factor, which I think is wonderful. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's very nice to, to be able to say that uh, because I've been to in, into this business since uh, 1974 and in the 70s, it was not as easy as it is now. Well, I think we were very much ridiculed at that time. But during the 1980s, the start, we started to turn this around. And when I went uh, to be chairman in, in 1990, I, I uh, was very, very keen on turning you for Sweden into a scientifically oriented organization. And uh, after that, uh, I can count on the times we have been ridiculed on my one hand. You know, it's, uh, it never happens because we don't speculate. We tell people and journalists what we do, how we do it and what our, our results are. That's wonderful. We, we have here, uh, an, um, it's an unknown, and they understand that we are, we are dealing with an unknown, and we have not all the answers. That, I think that's the, the key to all of this. If you have the answers, you're more like a, a cult or something like that. I mean, you should be very open-minded, I mean, as you are. I mean, you, I'm listening to you from the beginning here, I mean, you are really looking into UFOs the right way as UFOs trying to find a solution. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I think what the skeptics um, or debunkers, I should say either one, really jump on is when people go right to the ET explanation right off the bat without, um, y or claiming anything. Once you claim anything when it's unidentified, um, you know, you're, you're going to get yourself <laughs> ridiculed, yeah. I think. So, you make yourself a very big disservice by doing that. And uh, I mean, I work quite closely with uh, the skeptics here in Sweden. I even give lectures for them. And I'm also asked by them to give lectures on, on their behalf. I mean, we are not doing the same thing at all, really. But we are 
doing this, the thing with, with a scientific instrument that we can. Uh, we must work with a scientific instrument and we must work as scientists as much as we can. And that is the, also key to, to being uh, treated the way we are. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say using science or instruments, what type of, um, what type of instruments are you talking about? We are talking about when it comes to the ghost rockets, I mean, like going up to Namayaro with sonars and uh, radar, ground penetrating radar, mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, I see. Uh, mm -hmm. that, we, that we do. But we also do uh, statistics uh, and uh, look at um, the reports we, we, we are dealing with. I mean, we got 350, 400 plus reports every year to you for Sweden. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to get statistics of them. Uh, we did a very interesting thing in 2002, 4, 7, and 15. We went out around Sweden interviewing around 1,500 people, knocking wow. their doors, asking them, have you experienced anything unusual in the sky? Have you been watching something you didn't, didn't understand at the time? And it turned out that 1 in 10 had. So 10% of the Swedish populations have done that and nearly not any one of those one in ten had reported this to us uh -huh. to the authorities or to anyone but there are a vast amount of observations out there in the US in every country never reported because people don't know where to report it or they don't want to report it absolutely and I can talk my own sighting I didn't report because I had I never even thought to look online this was in 2006 Never even thought to even look online for anything. So I called the local police station and was mm -hmm. uh, basically dealing with a sarcastic dispatcher and kind of gave up. And I never even thought about reporting it. I, from what I've been told, someone told me I could still report it. <laughs> so I guess I still could. Uh, although, you know, at this point, I wouldn't even remember the date or anything. I could probably figure that out. But uh, um, so along those lines, someone wanted me to ask you this um, I know we're getting away from the ghost rockets I don't know if there's anything else you can add to the ghost rockets but uh, like I said that's always been one of my favorite topics um, so before I move on is there anything else about the ghost rockets you'd like to uh, close that subject with yeah maybe one thing you asked me about pictures before yeah and they really are another a film the film was taken in 1946 really that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a man who was head of a, a company, a photographic company in Sweden, in Gothenburg. He had a very, very last uh, film camera with him. It was a brand new color film camera. They were traveling to Stockholm. He was traveling with friends. And they stopped south of Norrköp, north of Norrköping in Sweden. And when they were there, he mounted this camera on a tripod and started to film the scenery suddenly one of his friends pointed up in the sky and said look there what's that and he turned the camera towards this object it was a cigar shaped object mm. flying out of a cloud and into another cloud and out of that cloud and he followed it all the way until it disappeared and I interviewed this guy uh, many years later he went to Stockholm he, uh, he called the military and they were, of course, very interested. So they developed uh, he was invited together with his friends. They were interviewed, of course, to sit in this, uh, uh, this uh, room with uh, eight or ten or maybe twenty officers. And the film was shown to them. It was blank. It was nothing. Oh. Because he had changed the, the, uh, the, the tele to telephoto lens. lens. And he forgot to to adjust for the light, so it was all overexposed. Oh they my could see God! Nothing. Oh, that is horrible. Jeez. He had been thinking of this every day of his life. He told me every day of his life after 1946, <laughs> he had been thinking about. It. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> a lot of times, uh, you know, the topic will come up while there's everyone has a iPhone camera on them or you know, cell phone camera. Why aren't there more really good? videos of UFOs and, and I got to tell you when I when I had my sighting as brief as it was um, I never even would have thought of a camera or anything I was just like 
in the moment trying to figure out what the heck was going on. And I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I've talked to Ray Stanford. He's he always has a camera ready. He always has for, you know, since his 1960s. Um, yeah. But I just I I of course now I, I think I'd be more apt to do that. But, uh, you know, when I first had that sighting of the camera wasn't even something I thought of um, in the forum. Someone said uh, they wanted to know if you would talk about the UFO sighting that you and your wife had back in 1995. Yeah, yeah, November the 5th. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've seen a couple of things, but this is really the most strange thing I ever saw. And uh, I'm not out looking for UFOs, <laughs> but I've been out hundreds and hundreds of hours looking at the stars with my telescope or binoculars or with my naked eye. But this time, at this uh, occasion in November, we were traveling from the north of, of Stockholm to our house here in, in the outside, outskirts of Stockholm. And coming into uh, this area I live, it was one o'clock in the night. I saw a couple of persons standing, uh, waiting for the last bus. And one of them were pointing up in the sky like this. Mm. And the other one was looking. So I asked my wife if she could take a look, if she could see anything. So she leaned forward and took a look out the window of the car, but she said, it's just stars. It's a wonderful night. I can see lots of stars, but nothing else. So we continue, and we had passed the guys at that time, and uh, parked our car, maybe two minutes later. And we went out of the car, and, and uh, we stood by our house and looked around at the sky, trying to figure out what they were really looking at. I think we, we stood there for a minute, maybe. And then, suddenly, just out of the darkness, quite, say, 40 degrees up in the sky, three illuminated cross, crosses like this came flying huh. beside each other, flying over us. And we saw them, both of us, and they flew over us, and they vanished behind our neighbor's house. And I, I ran around the corner, and I saw them flying. Um, or maybe 10 seconds more. And after that, of course, at that time, I was uh, head of UFO Sweden. We went inside and we didn't talk about this. I gave her a form and I, I took a form myself. We sat in two, dif uh, two, two different rooms and we filled out this form. We made the drawings, we answered all the questions, and after that, we compared. And I put an investigator to try to find the answer, but we never, never did. Wow. Now, I want you to talk about what you did was very important um, in a couple of different ways. First of all, you didn't have a conversation with the same person that witnessed it, and you did something immediately. Those two things are uh, very important, I think, when it comes to a sighting. Wouldn't you yeah. agree about that? Absolutely, absolutely. And look at the, we looked at the watch, of course, and took the exact time. Uh, so we oh, were, yes, we were able to right yeah but that, that is the most important thing and what is very much interesting and that gives us a, a, some sort of feeling about the UFO mystery I think I didn't say anything about this for for maybe a year or two not even to my closest UFO friends this was too strange it was so strange <laughs> but then I did I talked about it and in, in the radio interview I gave a couple of years after that, I told about the experience. And a, a listener called in and said, my mother saw something like this in 1930s. So I called her. And she had seen some very, very strange stuff. Because she was just a little girl at that time, maybe uh, 14 or 15 years of age. She was waiting for her mother outside the house. And it was the middle of the day. And suddenly she saw on the road, 100 meters from her, Three crosses came out of nowhere on the road for five seconds, then vanishing into thin air. It just was there. They were there for just a couple of seconds and then went away. Three crosses, but not up in the sky, but down, down on the road. That is really amazing. So had you heard of, besides that other one sighting, have you ever heard of anyone talking about crosses other than that? No, it's very, 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 very scarce. I'm, uh, I'm not aware of anyone seeing at least three crosses like this. If you look back in the 13, 14, 1500s, you can read about crosses in the sky. 
quite often. But most of the time they have seen something to do with the sun, some halo phenomena or something like that. Yeah. The crosses in the sky was really something that uh, uh, people who had very, very uh, deep beliefs could see. Mm. Nowadays, nobody sees crosses. Yeah. So, I, I personally yeah. think, that, um, I've said this before in this show, that sometimes I think the weirdest sightings are are some of the the best sightings because they're so unusual. It's almost like it can't be made up, <laughs> you know. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, why tell a story that is so bizarre that not even your wife or children will believe you? I mean, why? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I've heard some, being on the show, I've heard some weird ones. And a, f a friend of mine um, told the story a number of times on the Antiques Road Show, um, which is a popular show here. I mean, in the United States, not here in Russia. But <laughs> And uh, <laughs> he actually saw this box thing. Uh, it was a box-shaped thing. And then he saw it explode into five lights. And then the lights did like a formation. And a... Um, uh, uh, a fighter jet came after it hmm. and it disappeared but I mean you, you just hear these weird weird sightings I love them I actually love them um, yeah those high strangeness cases are not often mentioned uh, when you're writing UFO books or if you're giving speeches um, you're trying to make your your speech or your book as comprehensive and, and as uh, um, as you are really understanding the the, the phenomenon but I could say after more than 40 years in, in, in this business that I do not understand it because it's so diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago about uh, one, 100 years of UFO sightings over Sweden, which I have investigated in, in some respects, all of them. And uh, you can find observations that there, there are not handily fit, fitting in into, into the usual ET concept at all. They're just strange, but they are as real as anything you can read in another book. Now, what uh, are you familiar with the uh, very unusual um, sighting where this guy was on his horse cart and this thing came down in a field? Uh, did you ever hear that one? It was. Do you know which one I'm talking about? And he it's, went up uh, and then there were birds inside of it and all that. Did you ever hear this story? This is um. It was this a is very, not a new. It's a. It was it's a, an old uh, I think it was in the 70s. I believe it was in the 70s. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, I, I do uh, understand what you're talking about. Wasn't it something in Poland? Or? Oh, okay. Yes, it was Poland. Okay. I was thinking it was uh, the Netherlands. Okay. So, yeah, but that is that was another real fascinating, very bizarre case. That, it, uh, is, it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a member of the, the Magonia Network. Uh, it's a network of uh, quite a few, uh, you can call them level-headed ufologists, if you want. Uh -huh. But they are really combing the, the uh, old newspapers, old magazines, old books from the 1600s and, and up till 1946, 47. Uh -huh. There you can find fantastic uh, observations. I mean, you can find things that uh, defy explanations today. Uh, they are not talking about aliens, of course. They are not seeing uh, the, the, the popular ET-shaped uh, alien. They are seeing other things. But they are experiencing UFO sightings in, in their context, where they are when they were living. Uh, they didn't understand it, of course. As we don't understand what's happening around us today. So it's been with us for many, many hundreds of years, this, this fantastic uh, phenomenon. Yeah. And... Um I personally believe they could be they could have been coming here for millions of years it's just the way uh, civilizations line up could be you know totally different on another you know in another galaxy or you know another solar system um, if they actually are I mean <laughs> there's still I'm not saying for sure they are coming here because I have absolutely no idea so um, w what it's all about it's uh, and I, I had a conversation with uh, Jacques Vallée um, when we were both checking into the hotel out in Phoenix uh, a couple of years ago. And I said, I think I've said on the show that I do that uh, maybe it's something we haven't even thought of yet. And he kind of mm -hmm. laughed and he says, yeah, you're, you're, get, you're getting the idea of it or something like that. Um, yeah. 
So, uh, yeah. and you doing this for so long, uh, is that how you feel? You Do you feel like, you know, perhaps it's something where we haven't even had the idea of how to explore yet? Or do you think it... Yeah, it, it, I think so. I don't, I don't think uh, we have all the answers now because we don't have the tools to, 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 uh, to find them, really. And I think we do not really understand uh, the human psyche enough uh, because much of this is connected to human beings in a way that we, we can see when we are investigating UFO cases in Sweden. It's very important to follow the witnesses for many years. You can learn how they tick and what they believe, because not everything happens out there. Very much of it happens in here as well. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex matter. This You don't know really what that is happening in here can be something that is put in here from outside, of course, from someone else, something else, some unknown, unusual, natural phenomenon, or something completely different. So yes, we are only scratching the surface and to say that we have answers now is really to, to, to stretch it too far, I think. We have some answers, but the answers we have are the solutions of the misidentifications we are finding all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned that another thing that is or could be related is the high strangeness, the paranormal. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, th I think that's... That's what makes me tick, really, when it comes to UFOs, is the, the strange cases that are a little beside the ordinary cases, if, I could, if there are any ordinary cases yeah. when it comes to yeah. UFOs. Uh, I mean, I interviewed a guy who was 11 years of age in 1947. In September 1947, he was uh, walking back home to his uh, parents when suddenly he saw some multicolored rings come something this thick in the ground. I mean, it was impossible because the bubble would break if you do this. But he did it anyway. And there come, came another two of those guys with, in the same bubbles after him doing the Jeez. same. Unreal. And they, were, they were talking to each other. They were communicating, but he couldn't hear because sound seemed to be encapsulated inside the bubble. <clears throat> and uh, they disappeared. After a minute or so, they were they were gone behind a barn a couple of hundred meters away, and he went inside. And uh, first, he didn't tell anyone about it, but eventually, he did, and nobody believed him, of course. And now, I mean, a couple of years ago, he went he went to us to tell this story. He was a very very good person, very credible man, uh, who told a very strange story that we really cannot understand. What is this? Has this to do with UFOs at all? Yes, it was flying at least a decimeter over the ground, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not really what you what you talk about when you are dealing with with uh, with UFOs. I mean, there are lots of things like this. I mean, I talked to another guy who, in the late 1940s, his mother were out in broad daylight in in the garden when a cigar-shaped object, like a ghost rocket, but more like an Adamski mothership, really. <laughs> came flying. It was quite small, but it had portholes on its side, mm -hmm. and it passed him, and came uh, passed her. Sorry, and came back, and then she could see into the portholes. There were very ugly, strange, fearful, awful faces looking out at her. Wow! And it just blew away. Jeez! <laughs> wow! So yeah, I I want to talk a little bit about the that because uh, the cigar shaped things seem to have portholes or there's been many accounts of that but going back to the bubbles the people floating down in bubbles those had to be time travelers don't you think <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, i've told this story many a uh, number of times on this show and i apologize to the to the uh uh avid listener of my show but uh my friend's father here in Russia, um, and I found out it was only about 10 years ago, had a, a cigar-shaped thing go through a mountain pass when he was going through this mountain pass. Uh, all the cars stalled uh, while this thing was going through. They got out of the car, uh, one lifted the hood and stuff like that, trying to figure out what's wrong with the cars. And this thing floated through with portholes. 
And, mm. um, you know, they could see all the, the, the thing. He was telling me the story in Russian and it was being translated to me. And it was just like he was telling a story of everyday life. He's not a person that's into UFOs or anything. And then he said all of a sudden everyone's cars, you know, they could start and run and they all drove away. No one talked to anyone. No one talked to each other. But that's, I'm finding out in Russia, that's generally what happens. No one talks to each other. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. I went to Russia in 1993 and I met with lots of ufologists and brought back a huge archive from Moscow at that time. Wow. And uh, it was uh, very, very interesting to... Um, to see how the Russians were dealing with uh, UFOs at that time. 1993 was a very big interest. Um, they published lots of um, UFO magazines. Today it's not that at all. There are no really glossy magazines about UFOs anymore. Uh, and there are no really good UFO organizations either. Something's happened there. They are more interested in the paranormal now, I think, than, than, uh, than UFOs. Really? Wow. Yes, I've tried to find someone local here because there have been some sightings in this city. I found it online, but um, I can't find anyone that speaks um, good enough English to uh, mm. to be on the show. Uh, that's unfortunate. And uh, yeah. I've tried to work with people outside, you know, um, uh, Phil Mantle and a few other people trying to figure out if they could find someone here. Um, but that hasn't happened. So, uh, but... Just to let the listener know, next week, uh, Peter Robbins, he's from the U.S., he's going to be on, but we're going to be talking about Russian uh, UFOs. Uh, that, that comes up next week. Um, so yeah, they, are, they are interested. I, I, just yesterday, I was interviewed in, with, uh, in an interview with Russian TV. And, um, oh, really? In uh, Ren Moscow? T or? It was uh, called R-E-N TV, Ren TV. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure really where they, were, where they were located, but it will be broadcasted in a couple of weeks, I think. So, uh, But they didn't seem that knowledgeable, <laughs> uh -huh. to be honest, uh, about UFOs. But they, they did make uh, regular UFO programs. And uh, so you did you do, I know you speak a few languages, did you speak in English or? Yeah, yeah I spoke in English uh, because mm. I don't do Russian, sorry to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Wow, that's interesting. That's uh, I would be interested to see um, what type of programming that is because uh, you know I can't seem to find anything here uh, on that. So, um, so you bet you were here in '93. Is that when you said you were here? Yeah, yeah. It was a very strange time because it was the same day as the the, the tanks rolled into Moscow and they started to shoot at the White House. So. Um, Wow. It was a very strange atmosphere because uh, we couldn't do exactly what we wanted. People were shooting in the streets, and uh, oh my God. Uh, we, we went with a lot of military. I, I'm a journalist, so I, I worked for my newspaper at the time. But we were there trying to find the material at the KGB archives and other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did eventually, but it was quite problematic because uh, sometimes the subway were shut down. You couldn't walk out at that station because it was shooting outside. Wow. But uh, we will return to Moscow again, I think, in a couple of years, maybe next year. And uh, St. Petersburg, I would love to go there as well and to meet with ufologists. Yes, yeah, I would love to go to, definitely love to go to St. Petersburg. I mean, uh, any of that area, Georgia, all that area. Um, all right, yeah, so yeah. one of the things we wanted to talk about this evening is uh, military. Now, when you were talking, uh, when we're talking about military, and UFOs are you talking about um, like like for instance what you said earlier they had a top secret uh, program trying to whatever it was called find C or whatever you said it was called C yep. find <laughs> yep. so um, so what is the military Sweden's military's attitude toward the UFO topic well it started in the 1930s with the ghost flyer have you ever heard about the no, ghost flyer? Let's hear about that. It was the huge UFO wave in 1933 and 1934. It was uh, hundreds and hundreds of observations of uh, lights in the sky and of uh, strange aircraft never identified. It, they turned up again in 1936, 1937. Uh, and I think I read every single report and every single newspaper article about this. It was a real m mass hysteria together with something that could be of interest as well. But most of the things people saw were just uh, Venus and uh, all that stuff that skeptics say that people see. 
but the military put great effort into this because they could see those strange things flying over secret military installations as well and in 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 uh, very harsh weather so uh, i interviewed one one guy who was up on a mountain outside one of those uh, installations with his gun and 10 of his comrades down in the bunker uh, 50 meters uh, beneath him and when he heard something he was to ring in a, ring a bell and they were all come up running and shooting at this strange ghost flyer that was the plan but they never saw anything and they never heard anything but uh, many people did so in 1946 when this uh, ghost rocket wave came around people and the military were a little prepared they, they knew how to deal with uh, mass observations of strange uh, stuff in the sky. Hmm. So they started quite early with this secret group that worked with this. So and in the 1950s, it was still a very, very big interest from the military. They had certain people earmarked just to do UFO investigations up till 1965, when they turned their files over to the Defense Research Institute uh, and after that, not so many good uh, uh, research were, were made, really. They, they, they merely, merely took care of the reports. They looked into some of them, but they didn't really spend time with them at that time. So now in the 19, in 2000, there are not as big interest from the military side as it was once. They're turning their reports over to us now. So if people are calling them, they will be transferred to you for Sweden. Oh wow, that's amazing! <laughs> that's really great. Um, so, is there something comparable to our uh, the United States Freedom of Information Act as far as you know getting uh, documents, uh, earlier documents, or are they just plain releasing them? Uh, we have the same the same law as you have, mm -hmm. uh, but um, a couple of years ago, I asked the military if they could scan all their files for, for us. So they put uh, a man to do that for three and a half months. Wow. They were scanning. And eventually I got the one terabyte hard drive with everything on it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was good, of course. Uh, <laughs> is that actually... I mean, we have very good connections within... Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Now, is that something that is going to be available on... Any of that going to be available online at all? Or is it... What's the, what are the laws yeah. there like? The problem is it's in Swedish, of course, but uh, mm -hmm. the ghost rocket documents are also in Swedish, but some are translated into English. They are published on ghostrockets.se for free. Uh, you can go there and you can you can read uh, at least 30% uh, of it right now. And you can help if you can read Swedish and English, help us to translate more of it. So um, I can really... I can really uh, say that would be a very great benefit for this endeavor if we have more people doing that so we can get everything out in English. Um, we will publish uh, the Swedish material in Swedish, of course, uh, eventually as well, but that will be probably next year. Uh, they trust us and we trust them, and uh, of course they don't tell us everything. We, we understand that lots of military significant uh, material will never reach us. Uh, but um, we, we think it's a very good uh, neutral um, way to work. I wish uh, I wish our government would work in that in that way. With uh, you know, we don't, I don't think you know we have MUFON here, um, but it sounds like um, it sounds like your organization. I don't want to say is more organized, but it sounds. Uh, you know, MUFON's been going through a little bit of a rough, rough spot right now, a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, but it sounds like you've uh, been pretty steady uh, on what you're doing there. Do you also work with any other countries? Well, I met with uh, John Horson in in uh, Brazil in December. Mm -hmm. uh, we were there giving talks for both he and uh, me. Uh -huh. We compared notes quite a lot and. Uh, they do things that uh, we can't do, and we do things that th they can't do. Uh, that's for sure. They are good at many things, we are good at other things. But as you say, we are very stable. We've been stable for so many years mm -hmm. with uh, no turbulence, uh, no, no change uh, in the top, really. 
and uh, our our aim has been the same since 1990 really and uh, that's very very good and we work together with so many other countries especially through through AFU through the archives but mm -hmm. also through Europe of Sweden so an ordinary day I, I have lots of contacts with with people all around the world yeah um, how much of the day did you say this takes a couple of hours every single day of your life <laughs> yeah yeah wow it that's does. that's real dedication really is because I know you have to put food on the table too and you know uh, you know work uh, everyone of us has to most of us have to work um, yeah and yeah, I work full time I work full time at my newspaper as well and I write one book every year uh -huh. I'm an editor of the UFO magazine and I give lots of speeches and uh, lots of interviews and uh, trying to do some research and yeah I keep myself busy but I mowed the lawn today as well <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when a report comes in, can you explain what what the steps are that you do? Because um, you know, I most people are familiar with how MUFON works. Um, let's hear how your organization works when uh, someone comes in. What happens when someone contacts in, you? In a way, in a way, we work uh, very similar at the very beginning, and we have a website you can report through as MUFON does. And uh, when it's put there, uh, our report center take, uh, takes care of it and starts an investigation, if it's not just a speck of light in the sky, of course. But we also get reports through telephone, through ordinary mail, and of course, through Facebook, which is the maybe, well, we get at least 25% of our reporting through Facebook today, I would say. So after Amazing. that, we dedicate uh, a researcher to do, do uh, the investigation and uh, he or she which uh, we uh, educate to the field trainee course every year since 1977 I think it was wow. we started uh, will go out and meet with this observer if it is a very interesting report mm -hmm. if it's not that interesting we do a telephone interview or, or yeah you know we, we have to decide really mm -hmm. what to put the effort in and after all is done uh, this is presented before a group uh, that takes a closer look at, at the report and says, no, this was not properly done, you should do this, you should do that, or, or, or say, this is very good, and it goes back to, res to the researcher and he or she must do some, some new stuff maybe. And after that, the, the most interesting cases are evaluated by a group of scientists. Uh, we have psychologists, we have physicists, we have astronomers that takes a look at the very most interesting cases and give us their benefit of, of experience so we can get better. So, and after that, you can say we may have a UFO, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, wow, that is, uh, that is really great, um, the process that that goes through. Um, would you have some type of percentage that you would think that makes it all the way through to the end where it's still unexplained? You know, I mean, most of the years, most of the years we don't have a single UFO. I think uh, one or two a year may be a very good year. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, it's a bad year because if we if we can't solve something, we 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 have uh, we have missed that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. we would be, be better maybe. We, we don't have all the facts. But there are some very, very interesting cases. And I would like to, to, to mention one yeah, that yeah. has been all around this, I just told you, with all the scientists and everything, and, and, and we couldn't find a solution to it. It was uh, in, in January the 7th, 1995. Uh, I got a letter uh, from the observer a couple of years after that, and I could meet with, with her. Uh, at her house and she told me that she was coming back home from, from work it was around um, <clears throat> 5 in the afternoon and she had her husband a couple of uh, 50 meters away 50 yards away so she yelled at him that I will go for a walk she said and she went for a short walk but she just had walked for maybe 100 meters when she saw an object coming through the woods, very bright light, navigating through the woods, stopping where the woods ended. It was an open, an open field 
100 meters between her and this, this strange object. And the object was round, but it turned out to be like an eye after a couple of moments. Wow. was hanging. Jeez. And she was, she was frozen. She couldn't move. She was paralyzed. She said to me, I could only stand there. I couldn't move a limb. After a while, she cannot say how long. This eye turned out to be a ball of light again, navigated backwards, and she could walk. And when she came back to her husband, he had wondered where she went. She had been around, she had been away for, for much longer than she usually, usually was. But five days after this event, the neighbor came to visit and he was told this story and he said, wow, I experienced something at, at 7.30, the same evening. I was sitting inside my house and it's only some two kilometers away, inside my house looking at the TV. And suddenly it was a bright light outside. So I went to the window, I took a look, I thought it was a car that had maybe uh, uh, happened to, to get in, in the, uh, well, crashed or something like that, with the headlights turned into his house. But it was a ball of light outside. So he went out to take a look at that. And he moved towards the ball of light and he stopped and he thought, I will try to make a snowball or something and throw at it. So he bent down, took up some snow, and when he was to throw it, he froze. He couldn't move. He could just drop it and wow. stand there. Really? You mean like something was controlling him? Yeah, the same thing really that happened to, to, to the, the lady the same same night. And suddenly this ball of light, which was only maybe 20 meters from him, lifted up in the air, flew away. And when he went inside, all his television network was scrambled. He got cables that he never had before. <laughs> he couldn't get. He couldn't understand what happened. <laughs> wow, that is a, so that's a very strange case, and we we couldn't find an explanation, and uh, the scientists couldn't find an explanation to it either. Wow, wow. Um, someone wanted to know. I, I do want to talk about some more cases, but someone is uh, the second question. For some reason, I got on the Baltic Sea anomaly. Um, do you know anything about that at all? Yeah, yeah, I know the guys who are uh, who did the dive, uh, and I've been involved with. I've been uh, interviewed in the, in a documentary about it, and uh, I'm very, very skeptical about uh, all of the stuff. Really, I talked to the diver who, who, who went there first as well, and yeah, I don't think it's uh, nothing to do with UFOs first. Uh, the samples are to be rock, and there are other. Uh, formations looking very much like this if you look around the same area hmm. so um, I don't think it's got nothing to do with uh, anything to do with UFOs it may be something uh, geological interesting maybe but uh, yeah they have yeah. the money to go back it's very very deep it's uh, 80 meters down uh, it's uh, very expensive to do the dives to mm -hmm. go there Mm -hmm. And those guys have to make a living, and uh, this is not uh, giving them any money, <laughs> so they don't do it. I know there was something off the shore of California that people were speculating uh, very similar, um, you know, that they thought it was a crash UFO or something. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, <clears throat> But there are a lot of very strange natural anomalies out there when it comes to formations under the sea. I mean, I read the books about uh, unusual natural phenomena, and uh, doing that, I realized how strange this world is, and how many unusual and weird things that happens around us that are natural, mm -hmm. very, very uncommon, and seen by very few. So uh, I think it's good to be a ufologist, but you must also know a lot about psychology, natural phenomena, you must know a lot about uh, about uh, history, you must read a lot, I mean, just reading UFO books, that's bad for you, I should say. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, now, can you talk about uh, some of the other really interesting cases that were unsolved? Yeah, we, I investigated a case from uh, 1988, it was from uh, August the 28th, and um, the guy who, who, who experienced this, he, uh, he's a very, very nice guy. He uh, went out fishing. It's, uh, 
between, I'd say, north of Stockholm, not far from here really, maybe 200 kilometers from here. Um, he was out there, very nice day. And he, he walked out on the pier uh, trying to catch some fish. Mm -hmm. Suddenly he felt weird. It was as some electrical field had enclosed him, came around him in a way he couldn't really pinpoint. He felt weary. And the air was like filled with electricity. So he looked around to see what is happening, what's happening around me. And he looked up in the sky. And by chance, he, he caught, uh, he caught uh, a strange object coming from 80 degrees, very, very high up, hmm. flying down towards the lake in front of him with a tremendous speed. It was like a dark diamond. I will show you a picture here because I, put, uh, I have it in my book. Let's see if you can see this. Uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So he stands there and he looks at this strange object. And you think this will crash in the lake, but one meter above, it's changed its direction, 90 degrees, uh. and travels along the lake to the right of him, which is completely impossible. He said, it's impossible, you cannot do that. Mm. And the speed was impossible. And he could follow it, it was flying underneath some, some uh, the, the power grid that was further away. and. Um, then it was gone. It was just gone. So he, he put down uh, everything that was. Uh, and he he didn't fish anymore. He, he went up to the shore and he sat down on a stone. And then suddenly he heard a whining sound, circling around him like this. It came around like whoa, 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 closing in. But then it stopped. Wow. So I, yeah. He didn't tell anyone until 2001 when he contacted uh, me. So I, I met with him. And in 2014, we met again and filmed a documentary out there on this, uh, this pier. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told the same story all the time. And he said he didn't have a clue what it was. Now, when this thing was coming down and it, it stopped immediately and took the 90 degree turn a meter above the water, did it cause any uh, any ripples in the water or anything? Did he talk about that? Nothing? No. No. So this Nothing. Is, is so bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you have your dimensions there, you know. I mean, it wasn't really with him, in a way. It mm -hmm. was there, but it wasn't really there. It should have. It should have rippled the, the, the water surface, of course. Yeah. It should have heard a loud bang. It was traveling that fast that you had you had to make a bang. Isn't yeah, the, the sound barrier. Yeah. Not, nothing. Yeah, that's another thing. You always hear of high-speed UFOs, but you never, I've never once heard of someone say it, it breaking the sound barrier, making the boom. No, no, that's right. You know, Which they should, of course. <laughs> yeah, anything over 714 miles an hour or whatever it is, that yes. when it breaks the sound barrier. Um, and which is really amazing to me because you hear of stories of you know uh possibly you know in the multiple thousands of miles an hour you know even even some on radar yeah yeah which uh, yeah for sure i mean uh, that's just strange it's one of many strange things and and this guy i mean i followed him for many years i i'm, I'm still in contact with him from time to time mm -hmm. it's the same he, he doesn't speculate he, he has no idea he said it looked like uh, a bee uh, B1 bomber, hmm. something like that. When it comes to the the surface, the diamond shaped surface, mm -hmm. the sharp edge, that was all he could compare with, really. And there was there was a swooshing sound from it in some way. He thinks. Uh, wow. Yeah. And uh, you know, I've talked to a few people who have talked about feeling like the electromagnetic or some type of uh, pressure or something you hear all these different uh, you know they feel something going on mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and yeah really interesting the, the, the bad thing is that if he had told us this story the day after or the, or the same day we could have checked what happened with this object when it vanished because it was flying towards a small village hmm. and uh, someone there 
could very well have seen it as well. But we'll never know now, probably. How many years ago was this again? 1988. Yeah. Yeah, 28th. So now it's uh, quite a few years ago. Does uh, Sweden have any hot spots or has there ever been like what you'd call a flap? Yeah, there have been uh, a few flaps. In the middle of Sweden, it's a part of Sweden called Dalekarlia. Uh, they had a couple of UFO flaps with uh, the military involved as well. They were trying to find out what happened, but I don't think uh, anyone did. Uh, we have uh, some hot spots as well where people say that they can see things. We went there, but I'm very, very skeptical about it because when we took a car and drove the same route, people pointed at our car and said, there it is, that's a UFO, it looks exactly like that. So uh, I, I, I don't think we have any spot in Sweden that you really can go to and see things for sure. Mm-hmm. But you can go to spots and think you see things. Of course. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now, um, would you say that uh, there are any old-time researchers, you know, way before your time, that stood out as far as doing work in Sweden? There's one uh, that you can read in English as well. His name is Josta Rehn. One, at least, of his books was translated into English. Josta Rehn is not very well known today, but he was an academic. And uh, he was, uh, I think, the the first one that really tried to make uh, UFOs uh, academic in in, in a way. He treated the subject in that way. But he was very much ET-oriented as well. That, I think, was his problem because he didn't have really the proof for for what he said. If he hadn't had that with him, I think that could have been the breakthrough already in the 60s when he was most uh, prolific. Uh, he was over 80 years of age when he started interest uh, in UFOs. He came from the United States from work and came back to Sweden and then and, uh, and started getting this interest. Uh, so uh, very late in his life. But he was good at documenting. He interviewed witnesses, he put them on paper mm-hmm. so people now can read what he did. And his files we saved from the dump, really, because the... Wow. His family didn't realize the value of it. We had asked his family. It was the two of my friends in within AFU that had asked his family that could we get his files? And sure, yeah, we could. But when they came there, all that was left was a couple of books, which they considered files. So my, my, my friends, uh, Håkan Blomqvist and Anders Lilligren, they asked, but where are the correspondence? Where are the, the UFO investigations? Ah, were you interested in that as well? Well, we <laughs> put it out in, in the dumpster here a, couple, a week ago. Oh. So they ran outside, and luckily, it wasn't emptied. It was still there. Gee. Wow. So, yeah, I'm sure narrow, you heard. Go ahead. No, I was a narrow escape. I mean, it was yes, really, yeah. I'm sure you heard about the uh, Project Blue Book files that were found on Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um and that's that's all interesting. Now it seems like your organization would be a very good place for someone to archive files and things like that. You know, because uh, for instance, let's just I'll say this. I sat down and had a conversation at a conference with Travis Walton just chit-chatting and all of a sudden I said to him, "Hey, did Betty Hill ever contact you?" And he goes, "Oh yeah, we I have a ton of letters." from Betty Hill and I go I said you have letters from Betty Hill writing to you about your you know and when I hear something like that I all I think of is preservation you know um, I do as well I think so as well (laughs) Uh, because there would be that would be fascinating reading you know if they weren't too personal it'd be fascinating reading um, that documents, you know, two major cases tied together you know I mean just uh, two people oh many paper has been lost. I mean, we are we are sometimes too late. I always say to people, please contact us. We are we are taking care of anything and everything. Really. I mean, I, I travel Europe trying to save stuff all the time. The things we saved in Eureka in California last year, they were the Borderland Science Research Foundation's paper from the 1940s. 
the earliest UFO group in, in America. What was they it say called? The Borderlands Sciences Research Foundation. Wow. I've never heard of that one. <laughs> no, I mean, it was in the garage in Eureka. Uh, I went in contact with the guy who had them for years. Hmm. Uh, he never answered the phone from, from the beginning, never answered letters, never answered emails. But suddenly one night, I called him two o'clock Swedish time in the night, he, he picked up the phone. <laughs> and at that time, he, he was uh, he was hooked. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't get people to to, to, uh, to hang up on me in that uh, when it's some, something like that happens. We went there and we brought back everything to Sweden. So now it's, it's uh, safe here. And we are really uh, encouraging people to, to think of AFU before they die, because when they do, their relatives, they don't value paper much worth. Yes. They throw it away. Yeah, there's uh, there's been talk about someone like Paul Benowitz, for instance. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Um, yeah. You know, what, what happened to all his, you know, his films, his paper, his photos, and all that. I know that he, he went off the rails you know, toward the end, but in the beginning, um, he supposedly had some pretty interesting things going on there. Um, there's him, there's, uh, you know, there's someone I know that has uh, lots and lots of files, and uh, yeah, it is it is a shame. Um, you know, I'm in the uh, fine arts and the antiques appraisals, and I do all that stuff, so I, I do, you know, that's the first thing I think of is not not necessarily the value of something, but just the fact that, you know, preservation for for all, you know, type of thing. The, the monetary value is often not very high. Right. But the historical value and, and the research value. I mean, I've been to the United Kingdom. I saved Bufora, their, their entire archives. I, I, I traced it around Great Britain <laughs> from 10 different places. And I assembled everything. We brought it to Sweden, we scanned it, we digitized all their tapes, all their pictures, everything they had. I brought it back at the conference when they were 50 years. I gave a talk in London, I gave them a two terabyte hard drive with all their history. And uh, I've done this with Contact International in Britain as well, Flying Saucer Review. We have their entire archives in, in AFU. We have so many organizations that we have saved their files because they're just sitting in attics or in, in uh, even worse, in, in basements, damp basements. Right, yeah, that's been, a killer of all, yes. Yeah, I've been lifting books from, from the floor that were glued to the floor. Half of the books were still on the floor when I lift the box. Yep, and the mold, you get so, into mold and all that. Yeah. Yep. Now, what about, did I hear, um, did you mention something about the Wendell Stevens? collection? Yeah. Yes, uh, I have two uh, large boxes of paperwork from Wendell Stevens uh, down in my basement, which I will, I will sort before they are going to AFU. We have some more stuff coming in as well, uh, but um, that is uh, stuff we have to pay for. Um, I do understand that, because the guy who's got it had to pay for it once. and. Uh, we don't have money for that, really. So we are trying to, to, to get donations to do things like that. But that's, that's uh, yeah, it's like that. We are saving some part of it. But lots of it are still with another person in the US who is not uh, sharing anything at this moment, I'm sorry to say. But maybe in, in, in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so as far as, uh, as far as recent cases, that's one of the things I think I put in that we'd be talking also about more recent cases. Has there been anything really interesting going on? I mean, we get uh, lots of pictures because it's summer. People are out taking pictures. Mm -hmm. But the most recent interesting case that I've been involved in was from 2016, August the 6th. Uh, it's a high strangeness case as well, I should say. Uh, but that night, uh, the man and his wife in a uh, town south of Stockholm were out. They were barbecuing. They were looking up in the heavens. They saw some really strange clouds up there. They could see faces and, uh, and, and uh, human beings in the clouds. Uh, it continued for a while, but uh, eventually they went in. 
into the house, but then went out again around uh, midnight. And then they saw some people walking on the water outside their house. There is a small lake there. You see a group of persons that were standing on the water. On the water. On the water, <laughs> like Jesus. <laughs> and we're walking towards them. Uh, there, there is a small um, little wooden area uh, be, you say be, behind their house. And uh, those guys came walking towards this wooden area. And they were really scared. So they, they called the police. It was now in the morning. And they could see this one of those creatures up in one of the trees. And the police came. Uh, they brought the, the dog with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the lady who called us just a couple of hours after this happened told me that uh, the dog didn't notice anything. And the policeman couldn't see those creatures, which both she and her husband pointed to and said, they are there. But nobody else could see them. You mean they so could the still see them when the police officer was there? Yeah, they, they claimed that they still could see them. Wow. <laughs> but the police the police went away, of course, because what to do? I mean, yeah, they probably didn't believe them, so they they, they went back to the station, and uh, they abandoned the house. They they locked the house, and uh, they uh, took a car and went to a relative and spent the night there, and called us. They called uh, us in the morning, early morning, mm -hmm. and you I know, talked uh, great length with this lady. That's what I would do. Like whenever I see a movie about ghosts or something I would say I'd just pack up and get the hell out of that house right now <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't try to make it better or try to you know do anything I'd just get the heck out of there um, now a question in the forum here kind of related to this while where we're going here it says do you think the UFO phenomena is related to other paranormal phenomena I think that's uh, the path you must investigate there is you must deal with that, I think. Mm -hmm. you, can, you cannot say that this is something, it's not for us, because the paranormal and, and UFOs are in many ways connected. At least when it comes to how people uh, tell their stories about them. I, myself, I don't distinguish between visions of uh, Virgin Mary, or uh, trolls in the woods, or elves, or ET entities, aliens. They are, to me, uh, part of the same context, in a way. So, um, yeah, I, I think you should be very open in mind. But an openness, of course. That's very important. You cannot close the door here. Right. Now, when we spoke, uh, I think, three, three years ago or so, I remembered that you told me that there have not been too many abduction type cases. Is that still the same there? Yeah, it's still the same. Uh, it's very, very, very seldom. It's not every year. It's not every second year. We do get some uh, reports from people that are waking up with uh, strange uh, markings on them. That happens. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, what you see in the U.S. when it comes to abductions, you do not see here. And I cannot really explain why, but uh, no, and uh, the same goes with uh, Norway and Finland, I should say. Wow, isn't that, a, that's really something. And there are uh, so many, I don't even want to say how many thousands of people, or maybe even more, in the United States that uh, think something is happening. Um, but you did tell me, if you wouldn't mind repeating this, because it was, like I said, I think it was three years or more ago, um, mm -hmm. There was this one case that I believe involved a police officer or something like that, um, where his wife, uh, he actually saw something going on, woke up. Okay, yeah, it was uh, it was not a police officer; it was an ordinary guy. Oh, but, okay, uh, all right. I don't understand what you are what you're talking about. That is a very very strange story because I got a letter from from him from the husband after he read one of my books, and he said, "You must come here." and meet with us. And he explained in some, uh, out, outlined the story, but not in detail in his letter. 
But he, he got me curious, so I went there. And uh, he, had, he had not told his wife I was coming, oh, no. which he should. <laughs> so uh, he really, really, she wouldn't uh, say anything the first hour or two. But um, after a while, we, she warmed up and uh, we, we talked about many things and uh, she decided to, to share her experience. So uh, both of them told their experience to me. And the strange thing is that she, she said to me that when I am going to bed, I usually wake up exactly as I fell asleep. I'm not tossing around my, my pillow or, 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 or sheets or anything. I, I sleep sound and very good. But this night, she woke up, she told me. She was uh, crumbled like this, like uh, like uh, laying with his her face down towards the bed and her knees underneath her chest. Mm-hmm. And she was floating. She felt that she was not touching the bed at all. She was floating out from the bed. And uh, she couldn't see what was behind her, of course. But the room was illuminated with some sort of greenish light. And at that time, she felt, of course, scared. And she tried to wake up her husband. But she couldn't. She couldn't cry. She couldn't say anything. She could only whisper. So she took his arm instead. And he woke up and he told me that I could see my wife in this position floating out towards three creatures like from a Whitley Strieber book I should say the same large black eyes tiny nostrils slit to mouth and bald heads they were standing behind her and she was floating towards them so he thought what should I do he tried to kick them he tried to kick his side his wife and when he did that when he tried to do this it was completely dark in the room and he heard a a pounce like this and his wife was falling on the floor and she said I was outside the bed at that time Wow! and I I fell on the floor and if you think that is strange the next thing that happens is more strange I should say because she she goes up in in the bed again and uh, they talk to each other and say, what was that? I have no idea. And I fell asleep again. Uh. I mean, <laughs> if there had been burglars who have <laughs> anyone coming into your room, you would have turned every light you can yes. and, uh, yep. and you'd be running around calling the police maybe, looking for your rifle, whatever. But they didn't. Next, The next day they talked about it. And uh, very, very strange. And now they are divorced. Uh, which uh, happened, I think, um, between, I told you, last time and this time. Uh, I called them again, of course. I never I never let the witness be, if it's an interesting story. Mm-hmm. So I called them again. And now they have, have no, there's no sentiment. I mean, they have, have no reason to, to, to build each other's stories anymore. Uh-huh. But they tell exactly the same story. And yeah. she says, I never told this to anyone except my new husband, but not to my children. Wow. Um, now that that one is that's a great story, and um, it seems to me that uh, I've heard other people say after they have a major sighting that they go right to sleep, and it doesn't make it. It's another thing that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, just like you said, if someone was trying to break in the house, and you know, I've had that actually happen years ago. And I never slept the whole night. You know, no. I mean, I was wide awake, lights on, the whole deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I also have said on this show in the past, and it's because the way I feel is like, if I had that going on in my life, I would be a total mess. <laughs> you know, yeah. I really would be. You know, I, I don't know yeah. how I could really function. Especially these people that say that whatever it is is happening over and over all the time. You know? I agree with you. It must be tremendous pressure on, on those people living yeah. with fear <clears throat> every night maybe yeah maybe. not knowing when it's going to happen again no no yeah and so that was uh, several years ago is there any other abduction cases that you found interesting I know you said there's so few there are so few and uh, most of the abduction cases I have not investigated there are other people in, in New for Sweden that that did that. Uh, one that I did 
not investigate. But uh, I mean, I met with Betty Hill. I mean, I told you uh, last time. I don't remember, but I spent a full day with Betty Hill. And uh, oh no, I don't. Re I don't think I did know that. No, I mean, it was very, very interesting because in many, many aspects, really. Because um, she told me a lot of things that you cannot read in in, in books about her, about her UFO interest before the uh, the abduction. Mm -hmm. It was very because she had a big interest. She even saw a UFO crash before the abduction, wow. which, which is not very not many people know that. But she was with her sister when uh, when she saw this uh, strange thing in the sky crashing, and she went there and she brought back with her a piece of this craft, and that she told me that piece she kept in a closet inside Barney's and, and her house for a long time oh. until Barney said she, he didn't want it there and she took it out in the garden and then one day there came a, <clears throat> a lorry with gravel or something sorry with a, with a, yeah some sort of sand or whatever it was and poured it over this object <laughs> so it, it's gone it was still out there in the garden when we met with her. I, met, I think it was in 1987 I met with her. And it was still out there, she told me. Uh -huh. That is a strange story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you were actually at her house? Yeah, I spent the full day there. And uh, we, she baked a cake for, cake for us. And, uh, and she made a drawing of this uh, strange object that doesn't really look like the drawings you have seen before either. Wow. Um, uh, and... Uh, I mean, after listening to that story, I feel that you must uh, really deal with uh, the abduction case in different light as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was in that I lived in that town, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, yeah. back when you're saying in that whole area for many years, uh, growing up and everything. Um, so, wow, I d had no idea that uh, I'm going to have to talk to her niece. Uh, Kathy Marden about that. That's just really interesting. See if she knows anything about the thing in the garden. She never mentioned it before. She's been on no. the show a number of times. Yeah, I have to talk to her about it. Um, yeah, nobody mentioned it. I have it on tape. But I mean, nobody mentioned. Yeah, yeah, that's really something. Wow. Um, so, I guess uh, you know we're we're going to about we have about five or seven minutes. Um, so I guess I'd like to just ask you. Uh, I think we covered all the topics that uh, we wanted to in going in through all this. But one of the uh, the thing that's always fascinating is the unexplained cases, if you can think of any more that have come through your organization. Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of them, really. There. Yeah. Well, uh, let's yeah. hear some, some of your one, one or two of your favorites. One of my uh, favorites, I think I can call it, uh, is uh, from the 19, 1977, the summer of 1977, mm -hmm. when a, a Swedish fighter pilot met one of those objects and chased it in, in the sky. Um, he was out uh, flying on a training mission in the Baltic area, east of Sweden, when uh, the radar group leader on ground said that he could see uh, an unknown object flying from east to west uh, in, uh, to Sweden, really. This was the Cold War, and uh, it happened all the time. It was Russians, it was Americans, it was uh, well, other, other guys as well. Mm -hmm. So um, this fighter pilot, he, he turned his, uh, his aircraft to, uh, towards this object, and he flew directed by the radar leader to, towards the object. And when he came in a distance of um, maybe 20 kilometers, something like that, he, he got it on his radar aboard his fighter jet. We locked, we locked on it. And at that point, the object was hovering, stationary. It may have been move, moving a little, little. He, he wasn't sure, but most stationary. 10 kilometers, 10,000 meters over uh, the Baltic Sea. And then probably the object saw him because he started to, to, to fly straight up 
Mm. And he followed it. Mm-hmm. He was flying in an angle of 70 degrees. Wow. Which is very steep. That's very steep. Yeah. It's dangerously cannot, steep. Yeah. Dangerously steep. Can stall if you mm-hmm. don't watch it. But he, he, he was so interested in what this was. So he flew after it. But when he came to, uh, say, around 10 kilometers, he was outflown by it. And he said at that point, the, the object was flying out into space. Jeez. Wow. And he didn't report this because he said to the radar controller at, uh, on ground, the ground that this was too strange for him. So he said, uh, no, it wasn't here. It was gone when, when I came here. <laughs> so he went to the base and landed. And he never reported it. Really? Uh, but wow. the same evening, he came back to his wife. And his wife told me that he was old. He was shattered. This was said, this I saw today. It, it doesn't really... It doesn't really exist. And I talked to him in 1999, and just a couple of months after my interview, he was killed in the in the aircraft accident with a helicopter. Oh. I was trying to save people up in the north of Sweden, and his helicopter were blow, blown into the side of, 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 a, of a very high mountain, oh. and everyone was killed. So I only have one really long interview with him on tape. Wow. And, uh, and we couldn't, I couldn't put any follow-up questions, but I talked to everyone around him. I talked to his squadron leader, to his uh, other, the other flyers around him. They all watched for him. Say so he's a very good person, uh, but it was never put on paper because he never reported. Now, what is the deal with the military and and private um, airline system there as far as reporting UFOs? Is it isn't it required anything that's dangerous uh, to be reported? When I talked to his uh, his uh, commander afterwards, he said I really would have liked that he had reported this. Yeah, and uh, of course people do report things as well. Um, I mean, I take pictures. I got pictures from a, a Swedish uh, air, airline pilot flying over Kazakhstan. Took pictures of something very, very strange in the sky, which was a Soyuz launch. It turned out to be. Ah, mm-hmm. but I mean, they see things. They take pictures because they also have cameras. So they do that, and there is, of course, very. I mean, I mean, Dick Haynes has investigated um, aircraft uh, fighter pilots in report for many, many years. He knows. Mm-hmm. Lots of people see things when they are flying. That's right. Not everyone has the ability to take a picture, though. So, what about this pilot that took the seventy degree, uh, the seventy degree? Um, what do you call it when he was chasing after the UFO? Did he try to take any pictures? No, I mean this was not an aircraft uh, quick with cameras. Oh, I see. And in a fighter jet, you, know, you don't bring your own camera if you don't have. I mean. You have that option, of course, if you are out on a, on a mission like that. Yeah. But he never did that. And uh, most of the time, those things happen very quickly. I mean, I, I yeah. interviewed a, Alitalia pilot, an airline pilot from uh, Italian's um, airlines, Alitalia, who met what you can say a ghost rocket over the British Channel. Wow. And they were really hit by it. It was only a couple of hundred meters from them. It was coming straight to them. Really? He and, and his co-pilot, they saw it, and it's shh. So we called um, Heathrow Control, and they said, yes, we see an object 10 nautical miles behind you, flying away from you. So wow. they saw it, and he landed, and they asked, what was it? And he was told, uh, it's uh, probably a helicopter, or maybe something else. And he said, wow, wrong altitude wrong size, wrong speed, everything was wrong. It wasn't a helicopter. And the British military spent weeks and weeks and weeks and eventually produced a report saying this was a UFO and it doesn't matter because we don't, we have no interest in it. Uh, yeah, I always I always uh, like that when they always say that they don't have any interest in it. <laughs> no, uh, strange, but uh, sometimes they don't really. Do you think it's just because it's it can't be explained and you know why why bother putting any energy into it i mean why else would yeah. they yeah yeah it takes it takes some effort and some time and money 
yeah. to do it. Yeah. It doesn't give them anything back, really. Now, you mentioned earlier, we only have two minutes here, but you mentioned earlier that, you know, the military was involved in help, and even today they help you as far as uh, giving you information and sending along people. Um, was there ever any part of your Air Force that got involved in actually doing a scientific work, you know, like we did at Project Blue Book and Grunge and all that? Yeah, no, uh, never. Never in Sweden. It's never been conducted any proper science, just uh, assembling files. Nobody has really, from from the military, has never really tried to make science of all of this, which is a shame, of course. Yeah. Uh, they, they should have done that. So maybe we will do that. Uh, that there's lots of material. There's thousands and thousands of cases. So, I mean, you can do it. Yes. And just one last uh, question here. Has anyone ever tried to pull a hoax that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, just the other week, <laughs> lots, it happens. <laughs> uh, they put a, a, a picture out and uh, on, on Facebook, on our Facebook uh, page, and uh, said, uh, wow, I took this picture, I saw this object, it was flying over me. It was, we, I could see it within half a second that it wasn't, it was a reflection from the sun. Oh. And I wrote it, and eventually he he uh, he uh, agreed and said, "Yeah, I was just trying to to see if you would buy it." <laughs> <laughs> just checking you out. All right. Hey, yeah. thanks so much, class. It's been a real pleasure. Mm, the very same, the very same, and uh, see you. Yes, hope to meet you someday. All right. Yeah. You, all right. You take care now. You do. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. All right, everyone, so thanks so much for listening. I appreciate it, and if you were in chat, thanks so much for hanging out with me live. We'll be back next week with Peter Robbins, and we're going to be talking about uh, Russian UFOs for the most part. Since I'm here in Russia, he thought he would touch on that subject. And uh, again, we'll be back next week, and thanks so much. Also, if you're listening at this time, you are probably either listening live or a supporter, and I appreciate that very much. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.